Hello and welcome to Drydock episode 132. This week the questions come from the guide 194 on the carrier Grafa Zeppelin and the Wednesday video on aircraft carriers development in the interwar years. So let us begin. Mad Max fan 2002 asks, how effective do you think Grafa Zeppelin would have been had she been completed? Well, as I've said before, she'd be about as effective as her air group, so it depends on when she's completed. The thing is, whilst her air group gets more and more effective theoretically, the later and later she's completed, the later that she is completed, the more carriers, the longer range land-based aircraft, etc., the Royal Navy has to stop her. So <laughs> it's kind of a a race between the two and I don't think you can really say one way or the other um, at what specific points sort of past say 1941 or so one or the other would have a slight advantage because things change so rapidly if she'd been completed right near the start of the war in that kind of 39 to late 41 period which really marks most of the big German successes in Atlantic commerce raiding. Again, as I've mentioned before, that there is a possibility of her being relatively effective in as much as most of the convoy escorts at that time are not set up to deal with air attack very well at all. So using some of her aircraft as scouts and then using her strike aircraft to follow up on the scouting reports she'd be able to lay into convoys and unlike surface raiders she'd also be able to chase down convoys that scatter so because obviously torpedo bombers traveling at a couple of hundred miles an hour would be able to chase down merchant shipping that had gone 30 40 miles away whereas a single surface raider maybe can chase down one ship a couple of squadrons of torpedo bombers can chase down multiple ships and if the uh, strike aircraft have taken out the escorts, then obviously the, the ship itself could move in and use its secondary battery to help take down a few of the merchant ships as well, maybe ones that have been crippled by airstrikes. The main limitations that she'd have would be some of the aircraft, especially the various ME109 variants, probably wouldn't last that long in flight operations, so her ability to defend herself from air attack would be probably be markedly reduced fairly quickly into our operations and then of course you've got wear and tear on the air group and their ammunition loads now in theory she might be able to take on new aircraft and potentially even restock ammunition at sea through you know approaching the french coast aircraft flying out to her or and supply ships being pre-positioned as the germans did for fuel and everything but Whilst that gives her a little bit more flexibility than the average surface raider, and she theoretically would be pretty quick, she would have the problem of there being an awful lot of fast Royal Navy ships that could cause an awful lot of issues. Uh, basically thinking of things, well, actually pretty much anything from a large light cruiser upwards. Her secondary battery would possibly make her something of a threat to a, a small light cruiser like a Leander but once the towns the counties or any of the battle cruisers that's around at that point get in on the action they have the firepower to win a gun action and they have whilst she is theoretically somewhat slightly faster it's sort of walking pace faster so if they get into gun range and start closing her down then by the time she's worked up speed and starts running away from them there's going to be a fairly prolonged period while she's in gun range, during which time obviously damage can occur, including damage that might slow her down, um, or at the very least damage that would ruin her ability to operate aircraft. You can obviously make the argument, well, surely she'd be launching her aircraft to um, counteract that, but the point at, I mean, okay, she might not be quite as low readiness as HMS Glorious, but the fact is, if a surface ship shows up in gun range of you, and you're a carrier, the chances of you spotting, launching, and executing an airstrike before you get blown up are very slim, um, unless you have heroic escorts like with uh, Taffy 3, and obviously uh, she probably wouldn't have uh, escorts. And with a relatively limited air group, 
and the expanses of the Atlantic, plus the fact the Royal Navy obviously operating with radar could come in at night, she'd be at a fair degree of risk um, from allied units that were trying to hunt her down. Although, as I say, she probably would have something of an advantage compared to German capital ship surface raiders. But once you get past sort of the mid mid nineteen forty one period and onwards, um, she'd be pretty much in the same boat as most other German surface raiders when it comes to being spotted, tracked and destroyed by a mixture of land and carrier based aircraft. Reva asks, why was Graf Zeppelin designed for a speed of 35 knots? Whilst I get that faster than the other guy has considerable advantages in naval warfare, why were carriers so determined to be such speed demons? I appreciate the extra speed probably helps with launch and landing, but if so, what about the escort carriers and similar vessels? In Graf Zeppelin's case specifically, the speed was partly to allow it to hopefully outrun a lot of things, um, but in carriers generally the reason why they wanted to get to be so quick was effectively twofold early on when carriers were thought of sort of operating with the main battle fleet the carrier needs to turn into the wind to launch its aircraft now that may not necessarily be the same direction that the rest of the fleet is going so in order to allow the carrier to sort of pull out of line, do its flight ops, and then pull back into line as quickly as possible. The speed is necessary because it's got to be able to catch up back up with the battle fleet. But also related to flight operations is a carrier as an airfield is still a relatively short runway compared to a land-based one. And that means that an aircraft that's trying to take off can only take off at a certain weight. Uh, because it's only going to get up to a certain speed and it's only going to generate a certain amount of lift before it reaches the end of the carrier and then falls off into the sea if it's not going quick enough. By turning into the wind, you increase the airflow over the, the speed of the airflow over the flight deck, which in turn obviously increases the lift capability of your aircraft and thus the amount of load that they can carry. And then by being able to motor at fairly high speed, this further increases the apparent velocity of the aircraft and that obviously then gives them even more lift which means they can carry even greater war loads. So a fast carrier that's turned into a good strong headwind may well be able to launch a very heavy strike loaded aircraft or so full fuel load, lots of bombs, torpedo or whatever, whereas a slow carrier won't be able to quite launch the same weight of aircraft and a slow carrier that's got not got much wind is going to be really in trouble. Now when it comes to escort carriers, when you look at what the kind of aircraft they're carrying, you generally tend to find that they're carrying either fighters, which are much lighter than strike aircraft and therefore can just about make it off the deck in um, a fairly short distance, to compensate for the fact that you know shorter runway and lower speed of the escort carrier or they're carrying if they are carrying strike aircraft they'll be carrying ones that are either or carrying a lighter bomb load than the ones that are launched off of uh, fleet carriers and possibly also ones that have a remarkably good short takeoff and landing capabilities this is one of the reasons why you see a lot of swordfish on escort carriers in Royal Navy service because as biplanes and as a design in general they have exceptional lift so they're quite happy to go off and do that but you will very very rarely see a swordfish taking off from an escort carrier carrying a full torpedo load but you will very often see them carrying much lighter anti-submarine um, bombs or depth charges or rocket payloads which obviously reduce the weight of the aircraft and therefore the amount of lift it needs to take off. And ideally you'd want the carrier to be able to go fast which is why you have things like the independence class uh, like carriers that based on a Cleveland class cruiser hull are able to go fast but the whole point of the escort carrier was for it to be cheap and easy to mass produce and the amount of engine power you need to push something up to the high 20s low 30s of knots which is ideally where you want a carrier to sit is expensive and takes up a lot of space so in a small hull it's just it's better to have lots of hulls that can operate 
a small number of aircraft at that point than much more expensive single hulls that therefore you won't have enough to cover the convoys, etc. Econoclast asks, what was the first ship built as a cruiser and when did the armoured protected cruisers evolve into the heavy light cruisers? So the first ship built as a cruiser is very difficult to pin down. As you mentioned in the rest of your question, it used to be a mission description rather than a ship type. So a cruiser was a ship that you sent to cruise on a far distant station. And over time that could be anything from a brig or a sloop up to a third rate. And then into the ironclad era, various ironclads. You could have ironclads full-size ones. You could have ones that were specifically designed for operations on far distant stations, but effectively diminutive versions of the larger sort of battle line ironclads. You had ships that were of the ironclad era but weren't necessarily armoured much if at all that also did that mission. So they were all called cruisers in roll, but you will generally find them designated as corvettes or frigates or just ironclads in the latter part of the period we're talking about when it comes to official designations. There's also a lot of retroactive naming that goes on. So again, um, Econoclast cites the Russian ship General Admiral, which nowadays is seen as the first armoured cruiser, but at the time was classified as a frigate. So is it the first cruiser? Well, maybe by modern definitions, but at the time it wasn't called so, unless it was put on a cruising mission, but it was treated in the Russian or inventory in order of battle as a completely separate ship designation. The Esmeralda, the first protected cruiser, is often called that, but again, when it was designed, it was designed for a mission and it was called a cruiser in publicity, but that was in reference to its mission profile, not that um, Vickers Armstrong, or Armstrong at the time, was trying to say this is a specific kind of uh, new class that we're inventing. But because it, as a protected cruiser armour layout, it was the first and a lot of other similar ships evolved from it, it's sometimes seen as the first cruiser, e even though yeah, originally that wasn't actually its, its designation, but it makes a, as good as any a point to start from. As far as armoured protected going into heavy light cruisers, this is kind of a two-stage process. So at the beginning of the 20th century, you've got the armoured and protected cruiser, the armoured cruiser actually, in theory, develops off into the battle cruiser, although because of the speed of the development, armoured cruisers are still around. And then you have the protected cruiser gradually over the 1900s, going into the early 1910s, dying out and being replaced by what at the time is called the light armoured cruiser. So they've added belt protection to what were previously protected cruiser designs that just had a sort of a turtle back deck. But the size of the ships, the armament of the ships, and the belt thickness is nowhere near that of the armoured cruisers that are sort of tootling around with 7.5, 8.2, 9.2, etc. inch guns. These ships are four, 4.1, 5.9, 6 inch armed vessels. So they're seen as the light armoured cruiser, which eventually gets shortened to light cruiser as a sort of a way of defining it away from the armoured and battle cruisers which are much bigger and heavier than they are so the light cruiser designation is already in use by world war one and then you get to the washington treaty which limits the displacement and armament of cruisers and that with the washington treaty is where you get this heavy light cruiser split because now there is actually a restriction coming in now to be fair at the time of the Washington Treaty, the limit is just 10,000 tons and 8 inches, which means that the Washington Treaty itself doesn't provide for this split. That's actually the London Treaty that mandates um, so many ships of up to 8 inch guns and everything else is 6 inch or less. And this is why for a while you get things like, say, the Pensacola class designated as light cruisers, mainly on account of the sort of the old nomenclature of light armoured cruisers, because they don't carry a lot of armour. But you start to see sort of an informal designation split between heavy and light cruisers evolving during the 1920s, because you have these sort of Treaty Max cruisers with 8-inch guns and 10,000 tons, and this whole slew of older 
ships that are mostly armed with around about six inch guns and sort of about half or just over half that displacement and then that gets codified in the London Naval Treaty and then people start talking formally about heavy and light cruisers. DE173 asks, what are your thoughts about the US Bogue and Casablanca class escort carriers? They are a sometimes underappreciated aspect of World War II, but a very key one nonetheless. The Bogues, of course, being escort carrier conversions from merchant hull designs, whereas the Casablancas were explicitly designed from the ground up as escort carriers. And the different shows, I mean, you can look at battleship conversions to fleet carriers and regular fleet carriers as well, but the Casablancas and Bogues are so close in displacement and time as well, because you can also make arguments, things like Akaga, Kagi, the Lexingtons, etc., um, as compared to something like the Yorktowns or Hiryu, Soryu, um, that, well, technological advances, etc., et whereas the Bogues and Casablancas are within a couple of years of each other, and although they're of almost identical displacements, the Casablancas get a slightly larger flight deck, they get a slightly greater uh, speed, and they can operate substantially more aircraft proportionally to um, their size. I mean, it's it's only a half dozen or so more, but um, as a function of air groups' o overall size, it's actually quite a significant increase. And they're really needed because, well, apart from anything courageous at the beginning of the war showed, you do not do anti-submarine warfare operations with a fleet carrier. This is a very expensive way of um, decommissioning a ship rather rapidly. So the escort carriers allow for not just having a, a ship that, for lack of a better term, is cheap enough to risk going after u-boats it also means you've got the hull numbers you need because you're never even with the essex swarm going to build enough fleet carriers to do convoy escort as well as all your fleet roles so you need these small carriers because you don't need 70 aircraft to defend a convoy against a few u-boats but what you do need is a couple of dozen decent anti-submarine warfare aircraft which again would eat into a fleet carrier's strike and uh, fighter groups so they are absolutely vital they serve a, a fantastic role in the atlantic um, helping to win the battle of the atlantic but also they serve in secondary support roles across all sorts of theaters so a number of them help escort and accompany and even take part in various strikes that the Royal Navy launches on things like Tirpitz. Um, they also act as very useful aircraft ferries, so they're bringing uh, large numbers of aircraft forward to the front lines to reinforce air groups, etc. And, of course, they also have uh, a useful role in providing constant air support to troops on the ground, where the fleet carriers, which can also do that, may be necessary to fend off enemy fleet movements and that's why Taffy 1, Taffy 2 and Taffy 3 are actually present at the Battle of Leyte Gulf. They're not there to throw down with the Japanese Navy. That's what the big fleet carriers are for except Halsey goes charging off north but whatever. Um, Taffy's 1, 2 and 3 are there to provide fighter and strike support for the men on the ground and that's a very good division of labour which with the sheer numbers of them doesn't require the fleet carriers to be there so again it increases your flexibility it allows you to provide anti-submarine escort and support for your ground troops and still have a fleet a large powerful fleet carrier strike force so absolutely very very important ships josh thomas moore asks ignoring time and resource issues which ships that the germans made as battleships would have made decent carrier conversions also why was hms formidable in the surface action of cape matapan in terms of the german battleships any of them. The Scharnhorsts are obviously slightly smaller than the Bismarcks. Bismarcks are much larger, but even the Scharnhorst, they've got the speed and the size to make decent carrier conversions. Um, a Scharnhorst conversion will probably give you a ship of, with a flight deck length, etc., about the same as Karga, except it would be able to go faster. So a decent enough carrier and the Bismarck's of course being even larger uh, and okay they're still 
they still carry a speed and without armor and guns etc probably a little bit faster than they were historically so speed is good size is good um beam is is pretty good so yeah a any german battleship of the second world war would make a decent carrier conversion uh, quite happily as for why formidable was at the surface action of cape matapan that comes down to the fact that as far as Cunningham was concerned, there was not going to be any further flight operations at night. The Formidable could carry out flight ops, but Cunningham didn't have any fixed target bearings to actually launch aircraft at. At which point, well, he's going in knowing he's forcing a surface night action. And he knows it's going to be fairly point blank. He knows hopefully he's going to be coming out of nowhere uh, on top of the Italians. And he's also acutely aware of the fact the Italians might do exactly the same thing to him. So having Formidable off on its own in the middle of the night, so close to the Italian Navy, is basically a recipe just asking for some random Italian destroyer or cruiser to stumble across at point blank range and sink the thing. So it's much better to have Formidable closed up in the battle line in the circle of escorts and protected by the guns of both the escorts and the battleships themselves. Plus it also minimizes any potential chance of friendly fire because he knows where it is. Then once the battle actually commences, again, because of this fact that you're basically coming in almost on top of enemy shipping and you don't have an awful lot of time to train out your guns, etc., react, give orders, it means that Formidable is still in the vicinity, actually still in the battle line around about the time that everything starts firing. And although they do manage to tell Formidable, yeah, you should probably like not get involved in a close-range gunfight in the middle of the night where torpedoes and shells can be flying left, right and centre, uh, Formidable's crew are well, in creative in interpreting that. Order. Like, yes, we understand you want us out of the battle line and we will leave the battle line, but we're going to leave the battle line after having fired a few salvos of our own first. Next, how effective were Japanese submarines in World War II compared to the US or Germany? And was the Type 95 torpedo really a wonderful weapon, or did it have its drawbacks that mitigated its advantages over other torpedoes? The Type 95, as covered in the video on the Type 93, was a derivative of the Type 93. So um, some of the issues that it covered I've explained in that video but in short yes the Type 95 was actually a very effective torpedo it had range it had relatively speaking stealth it had a decent enough warhead and whilst it it like pretty much every almost everybody's uh, early war torpedoes had a few issues it didn't have anything like the issues that the Mark 14 had and um, even the British and German torpedoes with their various um issues with the magnetic influencer uh, detonators so it's fairly reliable as well where its effectiveness and indeed the effectiveness of the japanese submarine arm as a whole fell down is that there was a huge amount of potential within the japanese submarine arm for very very effective um campaigns they had good subs for the most part um sort of long-range decent performance arguably in many cases better than a lot of the subs on both sides present in the first few years of the war they had one of the best torpedoes and as was shown by some of them they could pull off some pretty spectacular attacks the two things that stymied them were one unlike the uh, Germans, the Kriegsmarine, with who obviously had the ability to just pop over into the Atlantic and start sinking things, there wasn't anyone close to Japan who needed massive amounts of convoyed merchant shipping coming in. There were large amounts of convoys in the Indian Ocean, going to and from Australia and other places, and obviously there were US supply convoys, some of which went over to Russia, and some of which were going Trans-Pacific, but they were all much further away from uh, the Japanese Navy as compared to where the Atlantic convoys were relative to the Kriegsmarine, which meant that by necessity any operations by the Japanese submarine arm against them, and there were some, took quite a while to execute and would have fewer boats on station. And when you're talking about operating in certain areas of the entirety of the Pacific and Indian Oceans, uh, 
there's also a lot more space to search out as compared to what the Codigus Marina had in the, uh, in the North Atlantic. So that limited their effectiveness. And the other thing that limited their effectiveness was that their doctrine mainly called for them to be going after warships, which is much, much more risky. And also there are much fewer warships, even when you're talking about something like the US Navy, compared to merchant shipping. So your targets are faster moving, much more likely to hear, detect you and shoot back at you. And they're just a lot rarer. So an awful lot of Japanese subs were deployed in efforts to attack either directly at the Allied fleets or troop and supply convoys that were moving up to the front lines, which again of necessity were generally better protected and on slightly more capable hulls anyway. And that meant that the Japanese submarine force would suffer quite bad losses, but also just couldn't get the level of success that something like the Kriegsmarine could. Um, or to, towards the mid and late part of the war, the US submarine arm and in the early part of the Pacific War, the Dutch submarine arm could have against the Japanese uh, merchant shipping. So uh, if you took Japanese subs and torpedoes and you put them in, say, you swapped them out for the German U-boats, so the Germans now have these Japanese subs and Japanese torpedoes and the ability to operate them, I suspect you'd actually see a significant increase in effectiveness, especially in the early to mid part of the war, of the German submarine warfare effort. But there's a difference between potential effectiveness and actual effectiveness. Bradley asks, how easily could manufacturing be switched? For example, instead of a Bismarck, you want a bunch of cruisers or subs. Could you just use the larger dry docks for multiple smaller ships? People often talk about how ex-Navy should just build Y ships instead, but how does this work out build-wise? It's generally more of an infrastructure limit than anything else. Uh, funding, if you say, oh, it costs X million to build this, Therefore, we're going to spend that on why other ships that cost a proportion of that. Um, so four destroyers instead of a heavy cruiser or a battleship or something like that. They're completely arbitrary numbers, but whatever. Um, the infrastructure limit is the, is the bigger problem because whilst in theory on some of the bigger slipways, you might be able to fit a couple of destroyers in, Generally speaking, you can't you, and you wouldn't want to. Um, you'd want to be building destroyers in the smaller yards that are best capable of handling those. So if you've got those smaller yards and your limitation is funding, then sure, cancel. Um, you can cancel a or not build a battleship and just build a bunch of destroyers. But if you only have, say, I don't know, 20 slipways that are capable of building destroyers and you've got five that are capable of building battleships well obviously five battleships are going to cost more than 20 destroyers but if you don't build um, those five battleships we've only got five more slipyards free and even assuming that they're big enough and that the dockyard infrastructure can handle building multiple ships on the sl same slipway and let's say you can build two destroyers because um, they have five really big slipways, that means you have a hard limit of 10 more destroyers. So you can build a total of 30 destroyers instead of 20 and five battleships. It doesn't matter at that point how much more money you throw at the problem because you just don't have the infrastructure. And a similar thing applies to the actual materials themselves because a battleship's going to need more boilers and more turbines, but it's only going to need one machinery set as a whole whereas if you cancel a battleship and order half a dozen destroyers that means six separate machinery sets you have to build six separate sets of fire control equipment six separate sets of communications equipment so whilst any individual set might be less expensive and less complex and take less time to produce than the one for a battleship producing so many of them might actually stretch your production capabilities to a point that you can't actually uh, complete things in time. I mean, you look at, um, for example, the battle class destroyers. Um, there were plenty of holes in the water by the l very end part of World War II, but they couldn't be completed because of bottlenecks in supplying things like fire control equipment. Now, there was enough to outfit a few, 
at a certain rate, but if they were building a single larger vessel, they probably could have got that single larger vessel out and into active service much faster because you only need one set of, okay, slightly larger rangefinders, radar, etc., and fire control units, but you only need the one as opposed to so many. And then when you're talking about cruisers and carriers instead of battleships, they take up pretty much the same space in uh, terms of slipways. Yes, there are slipways that can handle cruisers that can't handle battleships, but a slipway that can handle a battleship, whilst it can take a cruiser, is not going to be building two at once. Um, so if you say, right, well, we're not going to build these battleships, we're going to build cruisers and carriers instead, well, that's still going to give you a hard limit on what you can build, even if it is much cheaper. So one of the things that's quite often said, oh, Japan should have built a lot more carriers instead of building the Yamatos. Okay, there's a certain amount of argument to say that might have been a good idea if they can get their aircraft numbers up and pilot numbers up as well. But if you're going to be building something the size of Shikaku or Zuikaku, and you don't build the Yamato and the Musashi and the Shinano, that means you can lay down basically on a one-for-one -one basis. Just because the Shikaku costs a lot less than Yamato doesn't mean that you can build two of them instead of one Yamato across the entire range because, again, you hit the shipyard limit. You you will build two or three more Shikakus and you save a bunch of money. That That's it. You, you're not going to build six Shikakus because Japan doesn't have the yards to build six additional Shikakus at the same time. So, yeah, hopefully you can understand from that. If your limitation is monetary, then yes, you can build a lot more smaller ships for the same price as cancelling a few larger ones. But most of the time you'll find your li limitation is actually infrastructure, in which case you might be able to slightly increase the numbers of other ships at the expense of a capital ship. But you're not going to get anywhere near as many as just a simple cost analysis might suggest. And this applies even for... Um, the USA um, because when they were building ships in World War II famously just cranking out ships left right and centre but some ships were built with triple expansion engines in some cases because of it just made economic sense to do so they didn't have to go particularly quickly but in other cases there were ship classes where the US Navy would actually rather have preferred they have turbines but there was an infrastructure bottleneck of we can only cut so many turbine gears um, <laughs> in, in, in our factories we physically can't make any more turbine sets than we're actually making. And so if you're going to build the ship, it's going to have to use something that's not a geared turbine. Um, and to be honest, the US uh, was hitting various bottlenecks like this when it came to constructing ships. So the Alaska class, for example, just the sheer amount of steel that was going into all these various ships that were being built, um, they were faced with, we don't have enough steel. We can build this ship or this ship but not both at the same time so the alaskas were delayed to allow more essexes to be built um so yeah just because the u.s could potentially afford to build even more ships even the u.s was hitting infrastructure bottlenecks that meant they probably actually couldn't build many more ships um at least of the larger ones that um, than they actually historically did edax asks did Shanano ever have a chance of became, becoming an effective fleet carrier as a conversion if she didn't have to compromise her design by becoming a maintenance and support carrier? Yes and no. <laughs> I know that's incredibly unhelpful, but from a technical perspective, Shanano is a absolutely massive hull that can be converted into an equally massive carrier. Now, it's not going to be anywhere near as efficient as a new build carrier, but as well, Akagi, Kaga, Furious, Lexington, etc., Saratoga, all proved, just because it's not as efficient as a purpose-built carrier doesn't mean it can't be an effective carrier. So from a purely technical perspective, taking something like Shinano's hull and turning it into a gigantic aircraft carrier is entirely doable and it would be a fairly effective fleet carrier especially you know, without the 18-inch guns, uh, without a bunch of the side armour, etc. Her baseline speed would mean that her overall speed could probably actually get up to useful levels as opposed to something like cargo, which was a little bit slow for um, full fleet carrier operations. 
So that's the technical side. The practical side, though, is no. Um, no matter what you do to Shinano, by the time she comes out of the yards as, whether it's a fleet carrier, maintenance carrier, or hybrid of the two, there just aren't the pilots um, and the air wing for her to be an effective fleet carrier. Um, there's been too many losses by this point for the Japanese Navy, and even if they could fully stock her with experienced, well-trained pilots with the latest and greatest Japanese aircraft, they're still going to run into the issue of she's one big effective carrier up against a Navy that has a lot of big effective carriers. And so as, a, as an overall tool of taking the war to the enemy, it's, it's, it's on a hiding to nothing at that point. Live Errors asks, I have a silly idea floating around. I want to know just how silly it is. The rate of fire cruiser killer. Basically take a hull around the same size as a small battleship, but instead of giving it battleship grade firepower, give it something like two dozen six inch guns with a secondary gap battery of all the four and a half inch guns you can fit on the sides, along with light anti-aircraft. Probably armoured to take up to 12 inch gunfire to resist other super cruisers. How useful or stupid is this idea? So the single biggest problem you're going to face is real estate. So here's Wyoming in her World War II era guise as an anti-aircraft training vessel. And you can see she's replaced her twin 12-inch with twin 5-inch 38s. Now, granted, they are taking up less space than the, obviously, you can see the barbettes of the, of the old 12-inch guns there. But you'll notice they're not taking up that much less space. And Wyoming, for World War II standards, probably fits the definition of a small battleship relatively well. Cruisers are actually quite substantial vessels in terms of length. so And that's really the thing that you need to consider when you're um, laying out a fore and aft main battery. So if you're going to put triple six-inch turrets in instead of battleship-grade turrets, you're going to be looking at something that even on a ship a bit bigger than a Wyoming um, something maybe say Scharnhorst size at a stretch you could probably get an Atlanta style layout fore and aft not counting the wing turrets so uh, three super firing forward three super firing aft or maybe you do kind of like the Brooklyns or the various other um light cruisers of that period where you have the step up step down step up etc layouts but in either case you end up with three triple sixes forward three triple sixes aft so you've got a total of six triple um turrets and that will obviously give you a broadside of 18 guns but you're gonna be struggling to get much more than that now again grant you could maybe take an atlanta style approach um the italians managed to pull this off on the latorias as well and maybe have wing six inch triples as well so uh, if you took that approach maybe stick a couple of uh triple sixes on either side on wing turret so that adds another six guns to each salvo um, which will take up to your 24 gun salvo albeit that um Obviously, you actually at that point carrying 36 inch guns, just that six of them can't bear on the other side because please don't do cross deck firing again, it's a silly idea. Um, and yeah, so you, you could do it, the and then obviously cover the rest of it with anti aircraft guns. But the problem you're going to run into is that you're still building a battleship scale hull if you're resisting 12 inch gunfire or similar, then you're still building it with roughly battleship-grade armor. You're going to have roughly battleship-grade fire control equipment, battleship-sized engines. Effectively, you're building everything battleship scale with the exception of the main armament, and with that, the cost is probably going to be somewhat made up by the fact that you're putting in so many of these things as opposed to the three, four, or five turrets of a battleship. You potentially in the, the last scenario we envisaged might end up with uh, 10 turrets with triple sixes and so it's probably not going to cost that much less than a battleship and you're going to need it to go up probably battle cruiser-ish speed so you're going to be looking at more the cost of a battle cruiser which is quite expensive and 
yeah, in theory, you might end up being able to, well, you'd wipe out light cruisers and probably most treaty area heavy cruisers with the, just the sheer volume of fire. But any kind of super cruiser that is built to withstand other super cruiser fire, or at least heavy cruiser fire, is probably going to withstand this bombardment relatively well. Now, granted, that sheer amount of guns you're going to probably destroy its fire control equipment and other sensitive stuff relatively quickly but you are relying at that point on a mission kill and then just deleting its ability to resist outside of local control on the turrets but then you're going to have to have some other form of weapon system to destroy it because you can blow away everything above the citadel but if you can't breach the citadel Unless a fire spreads out of control, you're not actually sinking a target. So you'd either need escorts like destroyers with torpedoes, or maybe equip your own torpedoes. Um, and then you've got the issue of range, because obviously these 6-inch guns aren't going to have anywhere close to the range of uh, an 8-inch or 12-inch or whatever gun on a heavy or super cruiser. So it works in certain scenarios, but it is going to face significant disadvantages in others. Uh, to the point that it's probably not worth considering unless you just have it as part of a massive integrated fleet where it's never going to be alone. Vinve asks, I understand during the Age of Sail, the Crown planted oak forests in Britain for the express purpose of providing quality wood for Royal Navy warships decades, if not centuries, down the line, thus perhaps creating the ultimate long lead items. Is this amazing example of government planning and foresight true? And if so, do any of those forests still exist? Are there similar examples elsewhere? There are a few government planted and managed forests still around for naval timbers. There's one in Sweden, which is the one you can see here. Um, there's also one in the US that's maintained and in large part these days mainly to provide timbers for the constitution, uh, the ship, not the document. Um, and in the UK kind of it's it's a lot more how's what's the best way to put it it's a lot more random and scatterbrained when it comes to the uk and the royal navy than it is for some of these other more um well prepared forests shall we say when it came to oak supplies and such like for the royal navy they had to get mast timber from overseas because the uk is just not a good place to grow mast timber um mostly the baltic a little bit from the american colonies now when it comes to the oak however english oak obviously as the name suggests grows fairly well here but the royal navy's demands for timber were so massive at one point it was almost 25 percent of the entire timber output of the country that there was no chance that just britain's forests alone could support this effort so the Royal Navy imported vast amounts of timber from overseas as well as uh, homegrown stuff. And the homegrown stuff could come from a whole range of things. There was private estates, there were some commercial enterprises, there were the royal forests, obviously. And the royal forests were the ones that were perhaps, where you could say these were government-managed, government-owned um tree plantations effectively and that did happen to a certain degree there was there were controls over what you could and couldn't do to certain types of trees such as oak on in royal forests um, there were rights issued to take wood from certain areas etc and some of those are very old rights but in terms of ensuring that there was more oak to go uh, go around for the next generations of naval vessels a lot of it re relied on natural seeding by existing oak trees and kind of worked on the basis of, well, we only need to take an oak tree once it's got up to a certain size that it's useful, so we'll just allow it to spread its acorns and grow more oak trees in and around the area. And then when we take it, um, there'll be more trees to replace it. And there were some restrictions put in about sort of allowing animals to come in and graze or restricting them more properly so that they couldn't ruin the sa the seedlings and the saplings and the young trees. So there was a certain degree of management, but 
for the most part in the UK, there wasn't quite the same kind of, this is a strategic timber reserve forest and no one touchy, um, <laughs> which you got in places like the States and in Sweden. Um, probably the best example of one that's still around is the New Forest. There's still a bunch of trees growing in the New Forest that have been marked with the Admiralty mark saying basically hands off this tree we're going to use it to build a, a ship of the line at some point and then of course ironclads came along and they didn't um and it was a royal forest at the time so yeah that's probably the closest you're going to get to a full-on managed this is entirely naval timber forest in the uk john Rees asks did ships have special ordnance disposal teams on board during world war ii to deal with dud ammunition that had been generously donated by enemy ships and aircraft it varies a little bit but generally no uh so world war ii was pretty much the start of the formalized eod F um teams the explosive ordnance disposal teams across the British, American, etc. militaries. Now, the problem is because it's the start of these as formal organisations and those are mostly focused around things like air raid stricken cities, there aren't going to be dedicated ordnance disposal teams aboard warships. Generally speaking, ammunition that hit warships tended to explode. There were the occasional duds. Um, but it really depended on where that dud was because if the if the dud was high up in the ship like you sometimes had um shells fetching up in a cabin or something then the crew on board would generally just gingerly lift it up and over the side it would go um or in some fascinating cases they might even keep it um if the ordnance was embedded deep inside the ship like say the uh, Bismarck shell that fetched up inside Prince of Wales well you're not going to get it out any way easily it's probably in a section that's flooded anyway so that's going to be removed once the ship gets back into dock in all likelihood at which point yeah you can bring in specialist disposal officers etc but you've also got to bear in mind that aboard a ship a warship especially in World War Two, you've got lots of people who are trained in the handling of the ship's main and secondary batteries so they already know as part of their day job how to handle um shells cartridges all sorts of explosive and how to deal with stoppages jams etc etc so in a pinch generally you would just call on them because they would have most of the requisite knowledge to get rid of these kinds of things because you're not going to do controlled explosion aboard a ship you're gonna it's going to basically be extract the thing carefully so it doesn't go off and then over over the side um a very a very occasionally towards the end of the war you might have a specialist trained unit aboard but again you're not going to have a specific ordnance disposal team aboard just for that purpose it would be a case of we have these people on board they happen to have had the requisite training specifically in bomb or unexploded ordnance removal and so if in the event that this occurs and they're still alive we'll call on them first but it wasn't this is the the eod team it was just we happen to have a few people who are better at this than average aerospace gaming asks have hydrofoils ever been considered for use on destroyers as it could give the combatant with the hydrofoil a significant speed advantage and if the entire hull is out of the water it makes it a significantly smaller target for torpedoes and when speed isn't necessary the ship can sail as normal the answer is basically no and that's for two main reasons one of which is the development of hydrofoils there were a few experiments with some small hydrofoil warships in the second world war um, the germans built one to compete compare with their s boats the schnell boat um, but that's basically it so in the period of the gun and torpedo arm destroyer there just aren't hydrofoil designs of a significant enough size and even today the biggest hydrofoils in the world at least as far as i can determine are in the range of maybe five to six hundred tons which is nothing like the displacement of even a World War II era destroyer. Um, so, <laughs> the, 
even, even these days making a ship of about the, the size of a World War II destroyer with the armament and stability etc requirements for you know having all the guns up top is probably going to be pushing it and the other factor is just cost um the cost and the complications of operating something like a hydrofoil destroyer trying to get all that power down into the water etc is going to be quite considerable and destroyers by and large were supposed to be the smaller cheaper warships that you could build so by the time hydrofoils actually become viable for use in warships they are used in sort of fast attack craft and such but as i said no i don't think as far as i'm aware anyone's actually managed to crack a hydrofoil with a displacement of well over a thousand tons which is what you'd need these days even for a small corvette but um even in the 50s and 60s you'd still need something in the order of two and to three thousand tons to be a hydrofoil destroyer which as i say i don't think has actually been done Aaron Levi asks, at what point did naval designers realise they were just better off building battleships with full towers instead of a short armoured bridge with a sparse tripod mast above it, with examples being the Congo and Queen Elizabeth classes before and after refit and modernisation? It's basically around the time that you start needing an awful lot more equipment on the upper works of a ship. Bearing in mind that the time when you're talking about a bridge and a tripod mast, that comes from an era originally when you need the bridge to be able to see in from and command the ship and the mast is there largely to fly signals from and latterly to uh, hoist radio antenna you then get the development of rangefinders and fire control and once those get refined enough to actually be worth mounting higher than the turrets of the ship they go on the tripod masts but by the time you're entering World War I, that's basically all you need. You you need to be able to see, you need to be able to signal, and you need to be able to mount your, your range fighter fire control systems high enough up that you can get a good uh, reading at long distance. And for that, the that old format is fine. But over the course of World War I, you see the introduction of more rangefinders. There's the, now the need for torpedo spotting. There's also the need for more communications equipment, um, different kinds of radio transmitters, etc. You've got signal lights. You've got searchlights for night fighting. You've got spotting platforms for aircraft. You've got potentially anti-aircraft gun platforms for some of the early lightweight anti-aircraft weapons. Um there's a lot more going on a lot more sensors a lot more equipment and obviously as you go into the uh, 1920s and 1930s you are also now looking at anti-aircraft fire control systems secondary battery fire control systems they will have their range finders etc electronic systems like uh, homing beacons if you're on an aircraft carrier um, other forms of uh, communication equipment for battleships and then you've got radar. So all of this extra stuff needs to be mounted fairly high in the ship. And that's when, at some point during that developmental stage in the 20s and 30s, depending on the Navy, that's when everyone realises actually it's much better to just put everything in a massive superstructure tower rather than try and stick endless amounts of additional platforms onto tripod masts which is how you get the pagoda masts on some japanese ships this literally here's a big tripod mast now here's all the extra stuff we need to install <laughs> andre gardner asks what were the effects of navies adopting repeating small arms on naval infantry tactics small arm development and the firearms industry was there ever a small arms arms race he also says if this question is better answered in a special would you be looking to collaborate with a firearms history channel on such a special well, I think there is going to have to be a special on naval small arms at some point. And yes, I would greatly welcome a collaboration with uh, one of the many naval small arms um, or general firearms channels to do that. Because, well, apart from anything else in the UK, getting your hands on lots of firearms is somewhat difficult and somewhat frowned upon by the security centers. Why exactly does Sir need 16 repeating rifles and a Gatling gun? Um so yeah someone like forgotten weapons or other channels of that type would 
very I'd very much welcome a collaboration with them on on naval small arms. Um, of course, you can't forget they're also melee uh, small arms, cutlasses, sabers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, for something like that, I think I'd probably reach out to someone like Matt Easton and see um, if he's willing to do a collaboration on on that side of things. But future collaborations aside, um, effects of navies adopting repeating small arms generally actually not as dramatic as you might think and that is largely because the era of the reliable repeating rifle if you like or multi-barrel uh, not well multi-barrel initially with pepper pot pistols and then multi-chamber with revolvers and such it comes around at a period when boarding actions have fallen off quite dramatically it was roughly about the age of the steam powered vessel you do have various multi-barreled weapons like the aforementioned pepper pot pistol the knock rifle etc uh, famously seen in sharp a couple of times but whilst they might increase the individual effectiveness of the few men that can be issued with or can afford if they're buying them privately these weapons in the age of sail when you have boarding tactics go as a sort of significant part of your naval arsenal there's the slight unspoken fact of there's an awful lot of full-scale artillery <laughs> aboard the ship that will quite happily outgun any repeating weapon that you can issue to the men because you would normally only enact a boarding action either if you're completely desperate and your ship's about to sink under you like um, John Paul Jones or if you already have an advantage over the enemy and loading a carronade with several hundred musket balls and blasting the deck with the world's biggest shotgun is considerably more effective than arming your men with a few pepper box pistols by the time you've got up to as i say the age of iron and steam and repeating weapons are now becoming more common because ships are a lot more able to maneuver and slightly harder to batter into submission before they're at the point of sinking boarding actions are much much rarer and because of the sheer again the sheer increase in scale of naval firepower if you are in a boarding action the chances are you have completely and utterly disabled the enemy ship or you're holding your guns over their head as in your naval guns with the threat to do so at which point the fact you have a repeating rifle doesn't really factor into it too much um on land of course you have naval brigades etc but the evolution of those tactics is more properly looked at through the development of repeating armament in general in land-based warfare which as i said before i'm not the world's i'm not the world's greatest expert on by a long shot there are plenty more pe people more qualified than me to talk about that the one thing i would note though in terms of small arms generally and the navy is that because you had to have sea service weapons i.e weapons that wouldn't just rust up and jam and stop working in prolonged exposure to our salt water environment that did have some effect as far as i understand it on the development of land-based weapons as well so you i i've have read accounts of various officers looking to get themselves sea service weapons because whilst they're not exposed to a lot of salt water while they're on the land the fact that they are just that much more durable serves them quite well on land campaigns and some of the techniques in making guns work better and less prone to jam are that are developed for sea service weapons are seen um sort of cross-pollinating onto land-based weapons to just increase their efficiency as well and finally for this week what was the history and process of welding in warship construction? Uh, how many cases were there of welds cracking and causing a ship to be lost? And did it take longer to figure out how to weld armour plates together or were they just bolted in place? So in terms of the armour plate, that um, in, for the most part is never welded in place because it, it's designed to be able to absorb a lot of impact. It's designed to be able to then be once it's been damaged taken off and replaced so it's always better to bolt that in place um, as well as the fact to be honest if you weld everything together then well 99% of the time a massive impact on one armor plate will just shear the weld anyway so what was the point um, it's still got to be held on by some other method and if by some miracle the weld is strong enough to withstand that kind of shock well you're just transmitting the shock and damaging more armor plates which 
makes little to no sense. Um, but as far as welding in the rest of the warship is concerned, welding is gradually introduced into warships primarily in the 20s and 30s and then onwards into the 40s depending on the nation in question it's not quite trusted initially there are some issues with early welding um ship seams opening up etc although good quality welding is already by this point in the mid 20s acknowledged as actually superior to riveting um, one of the earliest all welded ships goes aground and the after action report on that although it's a civilian vessel basically states if this was a riveted ship it would have come apart um, the welded design meant that it didn't there's also the weight savings inherent to welding because obviously you're welding two bits of metal that are adjacent to each other whereas in riveting you have to have overlapping metal plus the weight of the rivets and that adds up over time even if you don't overlap the actual plates themselves you just use a riveting plate it's still additional weight so the use of welding to reduce the overall weight of ships is definitely seen as an advantage but again navies are generally cautious with this kind of thing especially when it comes to the structure of ships so what you tend to see is during the late 20s and early 30s again varying on navy um, welding comes in first as a weight saving technique largely in the superstructures of ships as opposed to trying to weld the entire ship and that works out fairly well actually you look at the Leander class for example there's a lot of welding used more and more as the class is um, further constructed and so some of the later Leanders are substantially lighter at launch than some of the earlier ones then as this technology develops through the 30s you end up with warships becoming welded more and more and more so by the second world war there's a, a lot of welding within warships although there's still a fair bit of riveting um, but some nations that are very advanced in welding techniques like the u.s navy will have a lot more welding in their ships generally than um, perhaps some other navies that are more reliant on traditional building techniques as far as welds cracking in a ship being lost i think something like two dozen plus liberty ships suffered that fate but because of the rather more um stringent and conservative techniques used by navies plus the fact that naval construction generally is just more robust and more, has more fail safes in it than merchant construction and of course the navy is usually going to demand the the best cr uh, welding crews on their ships as far as I'm aware, there weren't any warships lost in the Second World War due to faulty welds um, past the 1950s. I don't know, past. Um, but definitely on Liberty ships and such, there were a number of well-known issues with poor quality welds, cracking, etc., um, which resulted in directly in the loss of some of those ships. And that brings us to the end of this week's Dry Dock. Thank you very much for watching. And there's no channel admin for this week. Um, so see you again in another video.